Welcome to Tough Fish. I am so excited for you to meet today my friend Scott Perry, who is the creative difference maker for Creative On Purpose. Scott, thank you so much for being here. I've already introduced you in the bio uh, for the podcast, but please tell me first off, um, how did you get started with Creative On Purpose? Oh, it's a great question. Well, first, just thank you, Jen, for the difference that you make in the world, but also for allowing me to come in and have this chat with you. Um, you know, we know each other a little bit in, from working in a community together. So just really appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit with you and, and um, for your community. Creative on Purpose is an enterprise that grew out of an experience I had uh, while attending Seth Godin's Alt MBA in August of 2016. I went into that program uh, thinking that I was going there to build out my online teaching empire where I have a guitar studio that I'm actually just in the process of closing down this year. Um, and at the time I wanted to figure out how to do what I was already doing better and you know live the dream of making money while uh, I was sleeping and all that kind of silly stuff. By the time the Alt MBA finished, I didn't even want to be a guitar player anymore. I didn't want to be a guitar teacher anymore. I want, I knew I wanted to do something else. I didn't know what it was going to be. And so to the point uh, of a conversation you and I were just having a minute ago before we uh, started recording, I figured out what Creative On Purpose was by doing creative on purpose for a long time without any clarity, without any idea, without any direction <laughs> or intention. I was just blogging and broadcasting and trying to figure out what this thing was going to be. I knew that I was trying to marry my lifelong journey as a creative with my lifelong uh, study of Stoic philosophy. And uh, it took a lot of weird turns and at dead ends and cul-de-sacs it was called the store <laughs> guitarist at first then it was the store creative and eventually creative on purpose um and so it took took two two and a half years to get the brand right and then get uh another another two and a half years almost just to get the direction and the offering and the audience right but that's that's where i'm at now Oh, I love that. Now, I know that you quote Marcus Aurelius quite a bit because I follow you on Instagram, and I personally love that. I think that's really cool. But um, I'm curious, how does how did that start to shape getting this a book together? Because I know you've published two books, Endeavor and Onward, which, and Onward is out now. Mm -hmm. But how did you first realize that you even wanted to write a book? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> ever have any ass well let's actually let me back up when i was really young like seven eight nine years old i used to take out my parents typewriter remember typewriters oh, yes um, <laughs> and i would like r draw pictures and then type little stories uh, and then staple it together and create these little books that were like, you know, five by five, six by five, whatever. Um, so, at some, and, you know, human beings are, are narrative creatures. That's how we make sense of the world and how we make sense of ourselves and how we make sense of each other in our situation. So that was, you know, little, little boy Scott employing that natural storytelling uh, impulse but as I, and I always loved to write, like in school, writing essays and, um, you know, theses and things like that. But I never had any aspirations of writing like a book as an adult. And I didn't write my first one until I was well into my 50s. Um, and it just was like a natural evolution of all the blogging. I was, after a year of blogging, I was like seeing themes come together and then just deciding this is this this is a book so uh, it was in a way a kind of organic natural um natural process and you know we live in this age where anybody can publish a book it's you know you sign up for amazon kdp and it's you know if you can if you can fill out a couple of 
digital forms and upload a, uh, a PDF file, you can be a published author. Um, so it, you know, the, the, there is so little friction, su such the bar of entry was so low. I just, you know, I couldn't, once I got the idea, I just couldn't resist making it, you know, bringing that idea into fruition. So let's keep talking about that idea. How did it, how did you get inspired with that in particular? You know, you mentioned the blog, so it seems like the writing was showing up with different themes, but, but was there something else that kind of helped to really turn it into some momentum? Well, just that idea that I shared earlier, which is writing, you know, thrashing my way to clarity is what I call <laughs> the first five years of my brand development, which, you know, I, I, I don't know what this is, but it's something and I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to figure it out by doing this work that I do out loud and in public. I'm going to you know, show up and stand up and be seen and speak up and be heard and I'm going to put, put it out there until, you know, and pay attention to how it's resonating, who it's resonating with. And so the very, I, I've actually, I don't know how many, you know, all, all of my books are really handbooks. They're, they're very short. The very first one was called The Stoic Creative because that was the brand at the moment. And I wrote that book to figure out what it was that I was doing. Uh, and I released that book into the world and it got a little, it, it, it landed with an audience and it continues to land with, with an audience. And it, it was just, th that was the first step in this pursuit of thrashing my way to, uh, to clarity and, and, and onward, which just came out Thanksgiving. Um, I talk about my favorite word, which is cottywomple, which is an, a British slang word for heading, heading confidently and deliberately into an unknown destination. And Love to it. me, that's, that's writing, right? That's, that's life. That's any kind of worthwhile work. You don't know how things are going to turn out, but you have faith and you have, you, you know, decide that you have the curiosity and, and the courage to step into unknown possibility, unknown potential, and you do it until, until, you know, in ret finally in retrospect, it all kind of makes sense. You know, our stories are always much more linear when we look back on them than they are as we experience living them. That's such a great point. And as we were chatting before we were recording too, we talked about that inner editor, that little voice that can really stifle the writing in one of two ways. It can show up as, what are you writing? How is that? How is that a good idea? Oh my gosh, back, you know, erase that and start over. Or you're looking at a blank sheet of paper and going, oh my gosh. And the little voice is sitting there going, you need to get started. You, the blank sheet's not going to turn into a book without your help. What are you doing? So did you face that inner editor at, at any point in your creating your books? This is a great question. And my answer is probably going to sound different than a lot of other authors because I am the firstborn son, born a Leo, born in the year of the dragon, born to a mother who is a very tough Irish woman and a father who's a very stubborn Polak. I never have <laughs> really had experienced, you know, that those moments of self-doubt, self-loathing, and all the things that we hear are part of the writing, mm -hmm. writer's journey, you know, dealing with writer's block, dealing with the inner critic. Um, I mean, I definitely have my, you know, my imposter. I definitely have my, my inner critic. I definitely experience resistance, but never to the point where I am paralyzed or, um, you know, unable to step into whatever the potential of whatever it is that I'm setting out to do. So that said, you know, at, at the lessons for me are actually in uh, have been more about not rushing into things, but being a little bit more deliberate, being a little bit more contemplative, having a little bit more of a clear clarity of a goal and a strategy, um, being clear on, you know, who it's for and, and what it's for. Um, but again, all of this that we're talking about, this is narrative. So the inner critic is your, that's the inner storyteller, right? And, <laughs> and your inner critic 
is fulfilling its evolutionary and biological function. It's trying to keep you safe. And it, the best way it knows how to keep you safe is stay humble, stay hiding, don't make a ruckus, don't stand out, don't be seen, be heard, just do what everybody else is doing, keep your head down, and you'll be fine. And so, you know, interesting, uh, you know, my friend and mentor Seth Godin talks a lot about writer's block as, be, as a fairly recent thing. It's Mary Shelley's husband or something coined the idea. Yeah. Um, and before that, you know, writer, writer's block evidently wasn't a thing. It did, didn't become a thing until the idea of being a professional writer became a thing. And so just like anybody that's doing meaningful work, um, we have our moments of fear, doubt, and self-loathing um, because we will be judged because if we put it out there, people will have opinions um, and they will share them. And they, not everybody will love us and not everybody will understand us. Not everybody will like us. Um, but it's all comes down to this idea, I think, of, uh, of turning pro is the way Seth Godin describes it. And, and Stephen Pressfield. Who mm -hmm. coined I was the thinking that, too, with the part. resistance. Exactly. So, um, you know, you do not want the doctor taking out your appendix to, to have a appendectomy block, right? You don't want him to wake up and say, oh, I can't do this today. It's too, I'm, I'm too, too full of doubt, too full of self-loathing. You know, a doctor shows up, scrubs up. Doesn't matter if he just had an argument with his spouse. Doesn't matter if his kids are misbehaving. Doesn't matter if the car um, didn't start. You know, they show up and they do the work because that's the gig. And that's when things really, one of the things that really helped flip the switch for me around all this was to think about, um, you know, because of my musician's training, to remember, like, this is, that's the gig. This is what you signed up for. Do As a musician, do I wish every gig was the main stage at the Chicago Blues Festival? Sure. Is it? No. Sometimes it's the Holiday Inn Lounge. That's the gig. Mm -hmm. And you play the gig whether you feel like it or not. And you show up and put on the best show that you're capable of every single time. It doesn't matter where, when, and for whom it's it's being put on for. And then just remembering too, like what a gratitude, like what a gift to have the ability, to have had the education, to have to have the opportunity to do this extraordinary thing, which is to create something out of nothing and then create, put it in a, in a form where you can then say, here, I made this. It's extraordinary. It's not the work you have to do. It's the work you get to do and you should be grateful for it. And you know, that kind of acceptance and gratitude, I think are really powerful levers for getting past all those um, kind of destructive self inflicted uh, narratives that, that slow us down or hold us up. Absolutely, totally agree with that. Because it's one of those things where when you're also remembering the gifts that you have and the talents that you have, you are the only person who can share that work, play that instrument in that way. And that's okay. I mean, I like different musicians for different reasons, uh, but they all, they might play the same instrument, but they play it differently. And that's what they're bringing into the world. So I appreciate what you were saying. There was a quote, I think it's by uh, Hemingway that said, um, you know, I, I write when I'm inspired, but I make sure I'm inspired at 9 a.m. every morning. <laughs> that's actually, that's Somerset uh, Mom. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank he, you. He was asked by a reporter, do you write when... Do you write when you're on a schedule or do you write when you're inspired? And he said, I write when I'm inspired. Fortunately, inspiration shows up every morning at 9 a.m. Yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, I love that quote. That's a brilliant quote. And that's, again, speaks to this idea of being a pro, mm -hmm. you know, deciding that you're not going to be an amateur anymore, showing up and doing the work because that's that's the gig. That's what you're that's what you're called to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I would love it if we could switch lanes and talk about mm -hmm. Onward. Tell me about the genesis of Onward in particular. Um, on, so Onward is a book 
so the subtitle is um, Where Certainty Ends, Possibility Begins. And it's really a book about, it's a follow-up to Endeavor, which is a book about how to find the work that you're meant to do now, the unique thing that you can do in the world to help make things better um, to do and work that you can do that serves others. Onward is more about the posture and mindset of being a difference maker. So, you know, in order to make the difference only you can make, uh, you're going to have to step in, uh, embrace uncertainty and, and navigate adversity. Uh, th that's, that's the gig. It was as I began it in January of 2020, it was called something else and it really looked like something else. Um, when the pandemic hit, it started to come into the form that, that was published uh, just a couple weeks ago on Thanksgiving. And, um, and it was a book that was actually written entirely while I have been and still am a member of a community of writers. It's a, or a, a, a group called Writing and Community. And we are all dedicated to publishing a book by the end of this year. And we show up every day and post our work and respond to each other's efforts and ask questions and share insights. Um, and so I got a ton of great feedback as I was writing the book, which really helped refine the message, which is that it, it's a book in three parts that provides this process for stepping into possibility and, and developing your potential by asking the question, what's now? And framing your situation objectively and clearly without value judgment, without strong emotional attachments, um, looking at the possibilities and choices and deciding what's next and then stepping into that and then reminding yourself what it's all for, which is outcomes are largely beyond our control and therefore it's the effort, it's the integrity and, and intention of our effort that is the real reward because that will inform the the. The, our potential, our excellence of character, and and help and promote our flourishing as we do the the difficult, sometimes impossible work of trying to make a difference in the world and trying to make things better with and for the people we find ourselves with. So, when you're thinking about this process, were there elements that you were, as you were writing, that you basically had to exclude that you might have over I'm not I don't want to say overwritten because sometimes you have to get all of that going and so your first draft doesn't necessarily mean it's your last draft it's your first one to get all the thoughts out but that might mean that some things stay some things mm -hmm. don't some things get shuffled around some things you might say hey this is a great idea but this might show up someplace else at another point in time did you run into that and how did you make those decisions of what to keep and not I, one of the things that I started doing way back when I just began my blog was, um, and and honestly, it was a problem that of my own that I was trying to solve. You know, I have always been a writer and a speaker, a talker, who wants to make sure that I am absolutely positively, clearly understood in the way that I intend, which means I mansplain, <laughs> I over mansplain everything. <laughs> I refute any possible arguments to the contrary as I'm trying to make the one simple point that I'm trying to make. And to, to fight that, when I began blogging, I, I began on Medium, which allows you to, to, to um, tell how long it will take to read. And I wanted, I never published anything on my blog, uh, well, very rarely published anything on my blog that's longer than a two minute read. I want to make one point and I want to make it in as few words as possible. So in writing onward, um, yes, the point, the object from the very beginning was I want this book to be just as long as it needs to be to get this message across and not one word longer. So all my handbooks are generally pretty short. 
I really was striving with this one to 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 weigh in at under a hundred pages. Oh. I wanted it to be a book that could be read in an hour and a half or two hours, because the point is not. Um, definitely want the book to be readable and enjoyable as a literary work. Also, much more important to me that people take action with the principles and practices that I share. Um, so it's written in a very um, kind of terse, succinct, and provocative style, because the point is to not um, entertain, but to uh, provide provide actionable lessons that you are act, that get under your skin so that you actually do the work out in the world where we actually need you to show up and make the difference only you can make. I love that. I love that because the focus, it's showing the focus. And when you're writing a book, you know, there is the, there is something that you're writing it for, whether it's enjoyment and it's, Hey, that was a great escape. Or if it's something to teach and to, you know, synthesize in some way, but I like that you're, what you were looking for was not just synthesizing, it was, and what else? So what? So what did you read this book? That's great, but what else? What else are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna show up? What are you gonna modify? How are you going to make some changes so that you are endeavoring and you're, you're onward in your own endeavor? So I, I love that. I love that a lot. Well, thank you. So I'm curious, do you also read a lot of nonfiction or do you read multiple genres? What captures your eye? I, and as at this point in my life, I almost read nothing but nonfiction. And a lot of my reading is actually um, audiobooks during my infamous cemetery run. Nonfiction in audiobook is, is not a great way to consume, you know, if you're if you're trying you know reading a lot of you know leadership business personal development you know as i if i'm reading a book i got my highlighter and i got my pencil and i'm marking it up and i'm dog ear the pages and of course with an audiobook you can't do that so what usually happens is i listen to a, a non-fiction by audiobook i then purchase the book and then go through and mark it up and so um amazon you know, if they don't love me, they should, because I'm buying everything from Amazon at least twice. Um, but I, as a kid, I loved uh, fiction. And I mean, every kind of fiction. I read a lot of fantasy novels. I read a lot of mysteries. I read a lot of historical fiction. Um, and I, I still push myself to read fiction um, from time to time now. And I'm really thinking seriously about my next book, challenging myself to write fiction, because it's, um, yeah, just something I've never thought of before. But I think uh, it just, Onward was a book that came very easily to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I'm ready for the challenge of, you know, like I think dialogue is a, an extraordinarily hard thing to do well. And I would love to just, build the skill of being able to write dialogue by writing dialogue and nonfiction or in fiction. So that's, that might be what comes up for me next. I'm not having Ooh. decided ultimately. Oh, I like that. I like that. No, I, I like to, I definitely do the audiobooks, and I love the fact that you two maim, I mean, appreciate your books by highlighting and dog earing. I realize that that might not necessarily sound like a true book lover, but to me it does because that means that that book has been, especially when it is a nonfiction book, it's a book that's supposed to be used. I may not do that necessarily yeah. with fiction books, but I definitely do that with nonfiction. So I, I love hearing a fellow spirit who also does that too. <laughs> when, when I tell authors about how I, you know, how I brutalize their books, they almost always say, oh, that makes me feel so good, you know, because yeah. That's what the author of a nonfiction wants is they want this book to make an impact and it can only make an impact if the lessons get, you know, inside you. Um, so most, most of the nonfiction authors I know really appreciate when somebody's really, 
you know, marking up and, uh, you know, it's, as a former musician and guitar teacher, you know, I know a lot of people that have really expensive, pretty guitars that have done nothing but hang on a wall. That's not what that's for. You know, I would much rather see a guitar earn its patina by being employed, you know, every single day doing what it's meant for, which is to be played. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that you said that. That is so cool. Now, I, you said something earlier that I wanted to come back to. Could you briefly talk about your cemetery run? Ah. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually a story at the end of Onward where I unpack the origins of the cemetery run. But my wife and I raised our sons on a small farm at the end of a very long dirt road. Um, and about 10 years ago, when I finally decided to get serious about weight loss, I began my, you know, what was at first just a walk to the end of the driveway and back, but eventually became a, a, a three to 10 mile run, depending on the day. Um, when we sold the farm after the boys were grown and gone and sold the farm and moved to town, uh, I plotted out a run in town that had to cross a couple of streets. And in town, traffic's supposed to stop at the crosswalks and came, come to find out that actually doesn't happen, even though it's supposed to happen. Uh, my run took me to the cemetery and then I came back. I decided that if I didn't want to end up in the cemetery, I should probably just drive the quarter mile to the cemetery uh, and do my run there. Um, and so it turns out that the cemetery in town is on the highest point. I live very close to the Blue Ridge Mountains. The Blue Ridge Mountains are in the background. There's, you know, cows lowing in the field and deer out in the misty fields and beautiful, you know, grounds, obviously headstones too. But I mean, it's it's very beautiful. And it's become a meditation for me to just go to the cemetery and get my run in um, and then spend some time just, you know, kind of acknowledging and appreciating the beauty of nature and reminding myself that my time on earth is finite. And if I'm going to make a difference, it's going to require that I make the best use of the time that I have left while I'm still here. And so for me, it's a, it's a obviously something I do for my physical, mental and spiritual well-being, but it also um, has become just a daily reminder that this, you know, my time here will end and the leg, you know, the, one of the messages of Onward is legacy isn't what you leave behind. It's the difference you, you're making now. And so it's a re reminder to me to start, you know, to continue living my legacy. I love that. Scott, how can people find Onward and get their copy and how can they connect further with you? Uh, I am pretty easy to find on the internet. If you Google Scott Perry, you'll likely get a, a state representative from uh, Pennsylvania or the head coach of the Knicks. Um, at some point, those guys are going to move on and I'll reclaim my spot as the Scott Perry. But until then, if you add Creative on Purpose or Onward, I will be the first thing that shows up. Um, creative on Purpose is a blog and a broadcast. Um, that's full of insight and inspiration for people like us that are trying to fly higher in endeavors that make a difference. So if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, uh, definitely visit, visit me there. And Onward is easily found on Amazon. Um, and if you do decide to check it out, I would love for you to, to share a review and let me know what you think. Oh, that is awesome. Scott, thank you so much for being here on The Tough Fish. I so appreciate you. It was my pleasure. You are a great interviewer, and this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Jen. Thanks. Bye.